Leaves from a Russian Diary. Pitterim Sorokin. Part 2. 1918. Chapter 9. In the Bastille of Petrograd. Trapped. At last the Bolshevist cat has caught his mouse, and now I shall have plenty of time for repose. My labors for the time suspended I can lie all day in my peaceful cell hearing from a safe distance the devil music of the machine guns. My arrest occurred on January 2, 1918. After a sitting of the Committee of the Constitutional Assembly, Mr. Arganov and I went to the offices of the Will of the People. Arrived at our office on the third floor of the building we found everything apparently normal, but when we opened the door we were met by five or six men with leveled revolvers. Hands up! They cried. What's the matter? You are all under arrest. Members of the Constitutional Assembly are immune from arrest, I said, knowing well the futility of my words. Never mind. We are ordered to arrest you. That is all. Glancing around I saw that every person in the room was a prisoner and that the whole place had been thoroughly ransacked. But most of these people are workmen, I protested, and have nothing to do with politics. I insist on their release. At last, yielding to reason, the ranking officer agreed to take only the editors, Arganov, Stalinsky, Kukovsky, and myself, and from the business office Mrs. Arganov and three clerks. The whole group was driven to the Cheka, this new terroristic organization. Here, confined in separate rooms, we waited. After about an hour a man came to my room and ordered me to follow him. In the office of the Cheka I met Mr. Arganov who, with me, was put into a motor car and driven off at a rapid speed. Our bodyguards were silent and the window shuttered, so we had no idea of our destination. A quarter of an hour later the car stopped, we alighted and found ourselves inside the walls of Petropavlovskaya Fortress, the Bastille of Petrograd. In the office of the Commandant we found six or seven Bolshevist soldiers idly talking. For some time they paid no attention to us, but one, toying with his revolver, pointed it once or twice in our direction. Finally, we broke the silence. How long are we expected to wait? Is no one going to examine us? The Commandant will be here in a few minutes. Can we get any food? We are hungry. There is no food. Are prisoners allowed to see their relatives and receive from them food, blankets, books, and linen? Generally, yes. But for you, no. Why? Because you deserve not only imprisonment but immediate execution. For what offense? For attempt against the life of Lenin. Against the life of Lenin. Do you mean to say that we are accused of that? You are under arrest for the attempted assassination of Lenin. This was interesting news indeed. While we were digesting it the Commandant Pavlov, a man noted for his abnormal cruelties, entered the room, and after an icy glance at us, ordered the soldiers to lead us to number 63. A few minutes later a door of a cell in the Trubetskoy bastion clanged after us. We were prisoners of Peter and Paul. Number 63 of this celebrated bastion was a small cell with one heavily barred window. It was cold and dirty, with streaks of half-frozen water on the walls. There were no chairs, no bed, and on the floor was simply a ragged mat of straw. Our eyes growing used to the half-light, we discovered the silhouettes of two men drawn in pencil on the wall, and underneath a scrawled legend. In this cell were imprisoned the Romanian ambassador and the attaché of the Romanian embassy. Some days before they had been arrested, and now we were in the cell where first they had been confined. Some consolation, at least, to find ourselves in such aristocratic quarters. Said Mr. Arganov. Well, said I, I have been a prisoner of the Tsar, and now I am a prisoner of the communists. Out of this varied experience I should emerge a practical as well as a theoretical criminologist. I should call you a recidivist criminal. Suggested Arganov jocosely. If so, I am in good company, I retorted. Thus we jested, and when Arganov mentioned hunger I reminded him that since the communists were the most advanced people in the world, they must know what was good for us. After an hour of this we went to bed by huddling together on the damp and ragged straw mat. 
In silence and darkness our souls wrestled with secret apprehensions. I thought of my wife waiting at home for me in vain, her anguish when she learned the cause of my absence, the difficulties of the assembly, the fate of our newspaper. These troubled thoughts, combined with cold, dampness, and hunger, murdered sleep. Suddenly my companion, also sleepless, began to laugh. Did any of us who prepared and welcomed the revolution ever expect to be arrested by a revolutionary government? We both laughed and then I asked Arganov, how does this cell compare with your czarist prison? About as a country in compares with a first-class hotel. He answered truthfully. Ah, that proves you a counter-revolutionary. Silence again, broken by the dripping of water from the walls and interrupted now and again by the staccato of machine gun fire and the melodic chimes of the fortress, ringing every hour, how glorious is our God! What hundreds of revolutionists of the past have listened to those chimes! What tragedies have been enacted beneath them! During two centuries these dumb walls have witnessed fever, despair, death, and execution. Within these fortress walls lie the bones of many revolutionists. Here, in the church of the fortress lie the mortal remains of the Romanovs, beginning with Peter the Great and ending with Alexander III. Rebels and autocrats alike, their shades watch this hurricane of revolution which furiously rages above their ashes. The revolution will pass, its actors disappear, but the shades will remain, while new tragedies and comedies enact themselves upon the earth. At seven the next morning the cell door opened and a warden appeared bringing hot water, a small quantity of sugar and a quarter of a pound of bread for each one of us. You will soon be moved to a more comfortable cell. He said encouragingly. At least, I shall try. And sure enough, in about an hour he returned with the cheerful summons. Come along. The new cell was indeed much better, warmer, and drier, with two beds and a sort of table attached to the wall. How do you do? A voice greeted us through a small hole in the door. Could we ever have imagined meeting here? Looking up I beheld Professor Kokushkin and Mr. Shingarev, former ministers in the Kerensky government. Representatives of the sovereign people, welcome to this shrine of liberty. Said Mr. Avksentief, former minister of the interior. Very soon other ministers, Tereshenko, Kishkin, Bernatsky, Prince Dolgoruki, leader of the Constitutional Democratic Party, Pelchinsky, late military governor of Petrograd, and Ruthenberg, now one of the principal organizers of the Jewish state in Palestine, came to our door and congratulated us. They brought us bread, tea, sugar, some books, and also news of the prison. Arrested immediately after the Bolshevist Revolution, these men had been in the fortress for two months and were now old residents, privileged characters, so to speak. With them, in the most friendly spirit, mingled representatives of the old regime, Purishkovitz, leader of the monarchists in the Duma, Shegalovitov, former minister of justice, and Sukhamlinov, minister of war in the Tsar's government. They all met us, and I imagine, saw with some pleasure members of the new government in the same position as themselves. At four o'clock we were taken out for exercise in the yard of the prison, and had the happiness to meet our friends. Their appearance had altered sadly, Kokushkin and Shingarev looking really ill. Tereshenko, from a man very come ill foe, always cleanly shaven and exquisitely dressed, was transformed into a bearded man in shabby trousers and a sweater. Purishkovitz looked like a janitor, the work of which he really performed in prison. Walking up and down the small yard, our comrades warned us that our position in the fortress was extremely perilous. The wardens of the bastion, social democrat internationalists, were decent men, but the garrison itself was governed by Bolsheviki. In connection with the alleged attempt on the life of Lenin, they had issued a proclamation threatening a St. Bartholomew night and a September massacre of all prisoners of the fortress. The sooner all these counter-revolutionists are killed the better. Concluded this proclamation. Later, we all learned the truth about this attempted assassination of Lenin. A tire of his motor car blew out and Lenin, terrified, took this for the report of a pistol. That was all there was to it Kokushkin and Shingarev proved to be in an acute stage of tuberculosis and were soon to be removed to the Marinskaya hospital. Of course we are glad to go. Said Shingarev. 
but our happiness is clouded by the thought that you must all remain. Even in his weakened condition this man could not forget the misfortunes of others. Little by little we adapted ourselves to the routine of prison. At seven o'clock we got up, received hot water, a little sugar, and a quarter of a pound of bread for the day. At noon we had our dinner, consisting of hot water with some cabbage and a bit of meat at four o'clock there was afternoon tea, hot water, and at seven, supper, more hot water. In our dietary was too much water and too little anything else, but as we received a little extra food from friends, we did not actually want. The gloom of the prison was hard to bear. Even at noon in our cell with its one high window looking out on the fortress wall, it was difficult to read or to write. In the morning and afternoon the place was quite dark. Sometimes the electric light was turned on between six and ten o'clock, sometimes for not more than an hour during the whole day. Much of our time had to be spent in weary idleness. The hardships of life under the revolution had, however, developed in us all a keener sense of humor, enabling us to meet all new trials with a certain philosophy. Talking with our friends during the half an hour of exercise every day, exchanging news, cleaning the yard from snow and ice, gazing at the blue sky, we kept ourselves in fair health and spirits. As long as daylight lasted within doors we read and wrote, and some of us studied English. The adventurous novels of Conan Doyle and of Alexander Dumas most entertained us. Like boys, we devoured these romances, adopting in our conversation the phrases employed by our favorite heroes. Swear by the five fingers of my hand. This expression from Conan Doyle became a popular expression. The dark hours of the late afternoon and of the night were very irksome, lying down or pacing the cell, and thinking endlessly of family, friends, and the unhappy country. It was a week after our arrest before we had news of our wives. Mrs. Arganov had been arrested with us, and I feared that my wife also might have been taken. Where? If free how did she fare? Life in Petrograd was so full of danger that it is no wonder my mind was distraught. With great anxiety we looked forward to January 5th, the opening day of the Constitutional Assembly. In newspapers brought us by the warden we read that all arrested members of the Assembly were to be allowed to attend the first meeting. We even read that Arganov, Aksentief, and myself, had been liberated on January 4th and that our speeches, the text of which was actually published, were well received by the deputies. With excitement we awaited reports of the first day's sitting. Intense firing around noon of the day disquieted us, but we tried to believe that it was only the everyday music of the revolution. At eight o'clock word came, partly through the warden, partly through the evening newspapers he brought us. The Constitutional Assembly had opened. The ceremony of opening, election of the president, first speeches, turbulent behavior of the crowds in the galleries, and the calm behavior of the deputies facing terrible conditions, these we had expected. In the same newspaper I was astonished to read the speech I had planned to deliver at this first sitting, it was so fully reported that only those who knew I was in the fortress were aware that it had never been given at all. While this paper was being printed, the condition of the assembly was extremely critical. That morning thousands of people had gone out to welcome it, but Bolshevist machine guns met them and killed and wounded many. The streets, we afterwards learned, were strewn with bullet-ridden bodies. Such was the reception of the Bolsheviki to the Russian National Assembly and to the unarmed citizenry who went out to see realized the long dream of the Russian people. The dispersal of the assembly and arrest of the deputies is only a question of hours, we agreed after reading and hearing this terrible news. Up to this time all anti-Bolshevists had done their best to avoid civil war, but what was the use of such a policy when now these murderers were butchering hundreds and thousands of innocent people, forcibly suppressing the expressed will of the nation and handing Russia over to the German foe? Such were our feelings and the feelings of all loyal hearts throughout the country. Next morning being the feast of Twelfth Day, we were allowed to attend service in the Cathedral of St. Peter and Paul in the fortress. We listened standing among the tombs of the Russian emperors, lying peacefully in their eternal sleep. The Constitutional Assembly is dispersed. We read that day in the newspapers. Utterly depressed in spirits, we met that afternoon in the prison yard, saying goodbye to Kokushkin and Shingarev 
who that evening were to go to the hospital. Next day one of the wardens, bringing our dinner, said. Have you heard of your friends? No, has anything happened? They were killed last night by communists who broke into the hospital. In utter horror we listened to the story. The plan for murdering Kokushkin and Shingarev was made while they were still in the fortress, and by the connivance of Commandant Pavlov. I have to tell you. Added the warden. That attempt may be made to kill you also. We shall try to prevent them, and the only thing for us to do, in case the men come in great numbers, is to open the doors of your cells and of this passage to the yard. Only there is no way out of the yard. At least do that, we begged. It would be better to die in the open than inside like rats in a trap. All during that half an hour of exercise we discussed our situation. Ruthenberg, nicknamed by us Rinaldo Rinaldino, for his ever-dashing and picturesque suggestions, was for disarming the wardens, leaving the bastion, and fighting our way past the guards and out. The plan, of course, was hopeless. Purish Keech knew of an ancient underground passage leading from the mint in the fortress grounds to the old house of Peter the Great, near the Troitsky Bridge. In what condition this subway was nobody could guess. But if the door were opened it might be possible to reach the mint and try to make the underground way. We agreed to try it. Back in our cells, thoughts of Kokushkin and Shingarev returned to torment us. Anything more wantonly cruel than this murder was difficult to imagine. Both men had devoted their lives to social and patriotic service, and now, sick to death, they had been butchered in their sleep as enemies of the people. Night came, but we could not sleep. About eleven o'clock we heard voices, the sound of opening and closing doors, the rattling of keys. Don't be alarmed. Said a warden at the door. It is only new prisoners who have just been brought in. Next day we met many of these prisoners, leaders of the Peasant Soviet, members of the Central Committee of the Social Democratic Party, and deputies to the Constitutional Assembly. Arrests by wholesale were being made, they told us. Some prisoners were being sent to Kresti and other small prisons, while the most, distinguished, prisoners were being rushed to the fortress. The Devil's Pepper Pot, an anti-Bolshevist newspaper published at this time. The winter season in the health resort of Petropavlovskaya fortress has opened brilliantly. Prominent ministers, statesmen, politicians, representatives of the people, writers and other distinguished gentlemen of the Tsarist. And provisional governments, members of the Soviets and of the Assembly, leaders of the monarchist, constitutional democratic, social democratic, and social revolutionary parties are taking vacations in this celebrated resort with its well-known methods of medical treatment by cold, hunger, and compulsory rest, interrupted at times by surgical operations, butcheries, and other excitements. There is reason to believe that in the near future this exclusive circle will become even larger and more brilliant. Other health resorts, especially Kresti and Gorokovaya, are becoming quite crowded. In some ways our condition became a little better. We received letters and twice a week were permitted visits from near relatives. From 8 to 10 every evening our cell doors were left open and we could thus mingle with fellow prisoners. We exchanged news and were kept fairly well informed of what was going on outside. We even managed to edit our paper, writing articles and editorials which were taken out and published exactly as we wrote them. This reminded me of my first imprisonment in Kinishma, under the Tsar, when our prison became the principal center for the revolutionary propaganda of the day. Such things, I am sure, can happen only in Russia. The weekly meetings with my wife and with one dear friend were the happiest moments of my prison life. Once I was deeply touched by a visit from a peasant from Volodya province who, being in Petrograd for a few days, spent a lot of time and energy trying to get permission to see me. At last he succeeded and came to the fortress bringing me half a pound of butter, all he had. Devils! What are they doing to you? He cried furiously. Be careful, my friend, I warned, they may arrest you. Let them arrest me. I am sixty-seven years old. What can these scoundrels do to me? Nothing. If we had more such stout-hearted peasants, the present state of things would not be. My wife and our friends have tried their best to effect our release. Up to this time their efforts have failed, 
but they are not altogether hopeless. The accusation of attempted assassination of Lenin has, of course, proven groundless, but now they have a new charge, participation in creating a psychical atmosphere favorable to attempts against the Bolshevist government. The charge was general, no specific reason for our arrest being given. A month passed and we decided to send a protest against our confinement with a demand for our immediate release. This was addressed to the so-called Minister of Justice of the so-called Soviet government, Mr. Steinberg. This extreme left social revolutionary and his assistant minister, Schreider, had been associated with us in the Social Revolutionary Party and in the Peasant Soviet. Mr. Steinberg had become a socialist only in March, 1917, but growing more and more radical, he rose in his career, and after the Bolshevist Revolution was appointed Minister of Justice. Schreider, nicknamed by the peasant Soviet, the Goat, on account of his long beard and his little wit, was a stupid but pretentious person. We thought our protest hopeless, but a few days after it was sent the door of our cell opened and in the half-darkness we saw the figure of Schreider. He stepped in and held out his hand, which none of us appeared to notice. How do you do, comrade? Quite well, thank you, Mr. Minister of Justice, or Mr. Goat, whichever you prefer. Said one of us. Others began to accuse him of arresting us without cause and keeping us under conditions unheard of in the time of the Tsars. You were arrested by the Cheka, not by us. Said Schreider. But we insisted that he and that fellow Steinberg were ministers of justice and therefore responsible, and we finished by telling him to go away and think it over, if he could think at all. It was encouraging to hear, as we did at this time, that the murder of Kokushkin and Shingarev had aroused such a storm of indignation in Petrograd that even Lenin realized that he had gone too far and that repetition of such atrocities was forbidden for the time being. Yet the bloodthirstiness of the soldiers and sailors did not abate and the garrison of the fortress once more began to agitate for a general massacre of prisoners. One night four soldiers went to the guard's office and demanded the keys to the cells. The head guard, to his credit, absolutely refused, saying that he would relinquish his keys to no one except on written authority of the Minister of Justice. With a prophecy that this would soon be forthcoming, the headhunters left. The Ministry of Justice was communicated with next day, and with the memory of the murder of Kokushkin and Shingarev, and the fury which this produced fresh in their minds, the ministers issued orders against any attempt on the lives of prisoners. Everything has its end in this world, and our imprisonment in Petropavlovskaya finally came to an end. One evening a warden came to my cell with the abrupt announcement. Your wife and a friend are in the office with an order for your release. Take your things and come along. The friend turned out to be a man quite unknown to me personally. He was an old revolutionist named Kramarov. Now he was an internationalist and was cooperating with the Bolsheviki. Nevertheless, he bravely opposed the methods of the Cheka, and when he heard of my arrest, he went vigorously to work to secure my release. Now, having been at last successful, he came in person to the fortress to see that I left the prison without violence from the guards. Warmly I pressed the hands of those left behind in captivity, for the moment of liberation is always poisoned by the thought of those who cannot go free. Leaving the bastion, we stopped at the office of the commandant to have my order of release signed, and Kramarov, addressing the brutal Pavlov, said contemptuously. Well, rogue, when do you expect to be hanged? These insulting words, far from offending the commandant, seemed to please him. Who the devil can hang me? He asked laughing. Kramarov replied that he knew plenty of men who would enjoy doing so, whereat Pavlov said complacently. I know, but most of them are here now in my hotel. Ten minutes later, after fifty-seven days and nights of imprisonment, I drove out of the fortress.